Good morning and welcome to Melrose Community Church. We are glad that you have chosen to join us this today. And we pray that this, your time here would be a blessing, that it would draw you closer to Jesus Christ. We want to remember this Memorial Day, the soldiers who have given their lives for our freedom. We are blessed as a nation for um, our freedom that we have to worship as we please. So join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for the freedoms we have as American people and that we can worship you as we please. We pray that you would bless our time together and that you would be lifted up and glorified. And we thank you for your love for us and your patience and your, your kindness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul Well, good morning. Our text uh, today is just a, a verse and a half. If you have your Bibles, uh, uh, it's in Romans chapter 13. We're in, approaching the end of the chapter, Romans chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, you can pause the, the videotape and go and get one. But uh, this is a, a text that, uh, just a, a verse and a half this, today that we're going to look at, but most appropriate for us 
uh, early on in the shutdown, I encouraged you to uh, really ask the Lord to examine your heart. I encourage you to pray that the Lord would bring revival to your heart. And it's often been historically during times of pestilence or warfare that, that great revivals have broken out among God's people. And uh, God calling his people from insensitivity and self-centeredness to uh, spiritual awakening. Uh, of course, God might do that in individual hearts at any moment, but uh, it's important for the church in America especially that we need, we need to see a revival and awakening take place uh, among God's people in a, in a broad sense. And uh, my prayer is that God's spirit might stir masses of people to cry out to him for healing and for a new passion to serve him wholeheartedly. And secular historians have uh, described such spiritual awakenings throughout history. In the mid-1700s, there was a great period of revival that began under the preaching uh, primarily of a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He was slightly built. He was not exceptionally uh, passionate in his presentation of his message. In fact, uh, historians tell us that he would just read the text, quietly read through the text of his sermon. And people would, would respond with tremendous uh, burden and uh, crying out to God that God might cleanse them and take the burden of their sin away and give them new life. This was even before the revolution and uh, uh, rebellion against King George. In the 1800s, there was another such revival that historians speak of that took place uh, Primarily, the leader of that uh, revival and uh, spiritual awakening in America was a bi guy by the name of Finney. And even though I don't agree with uh, his theology necessarily or his methodology, it was obvious that the Spirit of God worked powerfully in bringing masses of people to repentance and a new hunger uh, sprung up among, among people throughout the land, a hunger to know God and to know his will. It's said that when Charles Finney uh, began preaching. Sometimes he would walk into a building, and at the far end of the building, where out of sight and out of sound of his preaching, even that the Spirit of God would come upon people so powerfully that some would fall to their knees, crying out for God to, to have his mercy towards them. In the late 1800s, there were great revivals under men like D.L. Moody here in America and uh, like Charles Spurgeon in England, and masses of people turned to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, many thousands of them committed their lives to carrying the gospel to distant lands. And so now more than ever, we need such an awakening in our land. And I've stated before that during this time of shutdown, it's difficult to assess whether something like that is taking place because we're not gathering together. And uh, I haven't heard of such uh, revival taking place, but that has been my prayer. Uh, there's never been a greater opportunity to hear the voice of God during times of solitude, during times where we are sequestered away, we're just with the Lord and with his word. And uh, so my prayer again is that God would call us from our slumber. Uh, if you have your, your Bibles open to Romans chapter 13, uh, look at me with, at, with me at verse 11. And Paul says this, and this do knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Now when the scriptures speak of sleep, it's not always describing those hours that you need each day to relax, uh, to let your brain switch to a different mode and, and so it can refresh itself. I've, I've read that during the day, the average person, uh, only 10% of your brain is active. <laughs> but when you sleep, 90% of your brain is active. And it is actually cutting away unnecessary data and uh, connection points from all of the events of the day uh, so that when you wake, you can be refreshed and ready to start a, a new day. It's a healthy thing for you to get sleep each night. Mark Lowry, a Christian comedian, uh, he, uh, he jokingly suggests that Christians should, uh, uh, should rename their beds the Word. So if someone calls you and wakens you early in the morning, you can say, I can't talk right now, I'm in the Word. 
I know some of you perhaps have a difficult time getting out of bed in the morning, and, and uh, the scriptures, however, for our purposes today, speak of sleep in a different sense than that. Often the scriptures warn us against sleep. Uh, in many passages, the Lord's warning is against the sort of sleep that carries the idea of, of an insensitivity to Him and a, a grogginess when it comes to His, his voice in your life. And and just a, a fogginess when it comes to knowing the will of God and carrying it out. So our attention upon the things of this world on, or, on, or on ourselves uh, is what God is calling us from, that we would be uh, alert to Him. Uh, one man uh, recently illustrated what we're talking about, this condition that we're to stay away from, and this man became an instant celebrity People around the world could not believe what they were seeing. Uh, he didn't realize it, but he was on TV, and, uh, and actually over 100 million people saw him do something that was just incredible. Uh, after, afterwards, a reporter went to him and asked for an interview. He said, no way. He was obviously embarrassed. He didn't want to talk about what they, all these people had seen him doing, and it was simply this, he was asleep. And you think, well, this guy, he probably sleeps every day. But in this particular instance, uh, his sleep was ridiculous. It was during the first quarter of the Super Bowl, last February 2nd, and it, it was incredible that this, this guy was, was asleep when so many tens of thousands of fans were cheering for their favorite team. It was incredible that he wasn't interested in the game. It was one of the best Super Bowls that I've ever seen. It was tight at halftime. In fact, it went all the way into the fourth quarter. Either team could have won. And uh, this man yet was sleeping. I guess the other thing that was most incredible about this was that the price of the seats averaged over 8000 and he had a, one of the choice seats, probably over $10,000 he paid for that seat just to take a nap. And uh, as I thought about that, you know, the same sort of incredibility could be attributed to some Christians. We, we are surrounded by not just tens of thousands, not just millions, but hundreds of millions of individuals caught up in spiritual battle. Not only human beings, but angelic beings that are engaged in, in a contest for the souls of men and women. It's incredible that some Christians can sleep, be totally zonked out when it comes to this contest that's taking place. Unlike the simple game of uh, moving a pigskin up and down a field, we are eyewitnesses to matters of eternal importance. And uh, the question is, how can Christians be sleeping? When you think of the price paid <laughs> that God paid so that you might be a part of this contest. How can any of us be asleep? So, you know, I could have titled this sermon, Dude, the game is on. You need to wake up and get, get, get in the game. It, it, it could be that the church too often is like Samson. Samson had been given the, the most exquisite gifts, uh, the most s unbelievable strength, the power of the Holy Spirit upon him to do great battles, and, and yet he squandered those things. His uh, focus was upon the things of this world and upon his own selfish pursuits, his own passions. He was distracted from the, the call of the Lord upon his life, and too often he was totally asleep when it came to hearing God's voice and what God wanted to do in his heart. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the tragedy of his life is kind of summarized near the end of his life when, when he was lulled to sleep by Delilah. Uh, he was totally unaware of her nefarious designs for him, and it was while he was asleep that his strength was stripped from him, and he ended his life in, in humiliation and defeat. And so <clears throat> the Bible warns Christians of such uh, grogginess. And uh, maybe it, it, today you will, in, in light of God's word, you will understand the need for your own spiritual awakening 
that your senses would be acutely in tune to what the Lord is doing and wants to do in your life, to hear his voice, be sensitive to his leading. So I'd like us to pray before we look at this text. Father, I pray that you would call us out of slumber, that you would open our eyes, that you would make us uh, wide awake to what you want to do in and through and among your people. And even during this time when we can't be together, we ask, Lord, that, that you would do a work, a mighty work in bringing us, bringing spiritual awakening. Uh, Lord, may it start in our hearts today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's three admonitions in this text that I would like to point out to you, and the first one is simply this, get with it. Paul says, and this do is how he begins this portion here and talking about uh, coming awake to God. And last week, we spent time looking at verses 8 through 10 and the priority which should, should characterize our lives to love our neighbor. Uh, this is a debt which we will never, ever fully pay, will never be done, will never make the final payment on this debt. And so Paul is simply saying here, like the Nike slogan, just do it. Uh, love. And you know, I can distinctly remember Saturday mornings when I was a teenager. My parents had moved out to a, a small little farm and uh, we had 10 acres, we leased 40 acres, we had alfalfa, we had fences to, to repair, we had uh, several head of cattle, we had about 200 chickens, we had uh, 10 sows, and we had uh, a couple of dogs and cats and rabbits and there were lots of chores to do every week, and my father had a full-time job on top of the, the part-time farming, and so every Saturday morning, he would come into my bedroom, and, and he'd say, get out of bed, let's go. It was usually right at sunup, and, and uh, he, uh, he wasn't very sensitive to three teenage boys we shared a room who'd been out late the night before. Sometimes he would yank the blankets off, and he would yell at us get up, you're wasting the day, there's chores to do. And he would let us know there, was, there would be no discussion about it, there would be no delay, we were supposed to get up. Now when I became a father, there was one in my household who took a much gentler approach to waking my children when they were drowsy, and she will go unnamed, but she has been a wonderful mother to my kids. Uh, one of the creative ways that uh, she dreamed up of rousting my kids out of bed was when she donned her wake-up fairy costume. And uh, she would put on a tutu. She had a sparkly little wand. She would go into the bedroom and tap them gently and say something like, bippity-boppity-boo, it's time to get up and move. <laughs> um, yeah, my son especially enjoyed those mornings. But this passage <laughs> is not a wake-up fairy sort of a, an admonition. It's more like my father's approach. Get with it. Get up. And there are many warnings in Scripture about being lazy and staying asleep. In the book of Proverbs, it says this, As a door swings back and forth on its hinges, so the lazy person turns over in bed. And the idea here is that the lazy person might go back and forth, but, you know, the door is firmly secured to the door frame. It never really goes anywhere. It doesn't ever get out of bed. And, and the warning here is not only in a literal sense for, for the lazy person that doesn't want to get out of bed and get about the activity of the day, but for the Christian who may hear the, the admonitions from the Lord, who may, who may hear the voice of God calling to him, but, and he, he just kind of moves back and forth, but he never launches out into ministry. He never takes the step in what God has called him to do with his life. He just, he's like a, a door on the hinges. He never really goes anywhere. He might hear sermon after sermon. He might, he might feel moved a little bit, but he never really embraces what God has called him to do. He never really has a change of heart. You know, we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this is basically just a review of what we talked about last week. He says, now, now do this. You need to move. You need to love your neighbor. 
And I reminded you uh, last week that love is the greatest. There's no greater calling. Without love, you're a big fat zero. It's an action word. You have to move. You can't be asleep and fulfill the, the command to love. And uh, we also looked at the fact that it miraculously fills God's call upon your life. To love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as yourself, it fulfills his desire for you. I read recently uh, a Christian author who described one night she was on a bus uh, from uh, Flagstaff to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it was a cold winter day in February, and, and uh, shortly after they departed from Flagstaff, they stopped at a small Indian village, and a young teenage, uh, teenage Indian boy got on the bus, and it was, she sat, he sat right behind this lady named Opal, and uh, it didn't take long, and because of the warmth of the bus, that this young man fell asleep, and and uh, a couple hours later, he, he woke up and he ran to the front of the bus and he asked the driver about a particular stop. And, and he said, well, that was way many miles back. And, and the young man said, stop, I need, that's where I need to get off. And, and the, the bus driver said, no, it's, it's too far for you to walk. I can't drop you off here. You have to go all the way to Albuquerque and catch the bus back. Well, the young man was distraught. He came and sat behind Opal and he was very disturbed, and she, she turned and asked him what the problem was, if, if she could help. And he said, well, I've never been to Albuquerque. I don't have any more money, and they're going to charge me to go back uh, to my original stop. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I, 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 I just am, am lost. And Opal said, you know, let me see if I can take care of it. And she walked up and talked to the bus driver and asked the bus driver if, if he would make sure when they got to Albuquerque that he wouldn't be charged and that he would get a return trip to his stop and that if there were any charges, she would pay for it. And so she went back and she turned to him and, and uh, said, uh, don't, listen, don't worry. I've taken care of it. You just stick with me. When we get to Albuquerque, I'll make sure you get your tickets. Uh, you won't be charged. It's all taken care of. And then... Uh, she turned and said, just sitting there and enjoying the ride the rest of the way. And suddenly, a few minutes later, she felt a tap on her shoulder. And this young man said, um, Ma'am, are you a Christian? I guess the question for us in light of this text is Has there ever been a time when someone just asked you, are you a Christian? Because of the love that you've shown to them. It should be. That should be what is most obvious about our lives. That the world will know that, will know that we're followers of Christ because of the love that we have for one another and for those outside of the family of God. <clears throat> but to have that kind of love to have that kind of love characterize your life means that you have to be awake. You have to be alert to recognize the needs around you and such opportunities to show the love of Christ to another. So, the first admonition here is get with it. The second one is this. Know where you are. I read of this elderly Florida woman who did her shopping and when she got out to the car, she saw four males in her car getting ready to leave she immediately dropped her groceries reached in her purse pulled out a pistol and said stop right there get out of my car i have a gun you scum <laughs> the four young men ran <laughs> and uh, she gathered herself got her groceries back together got in the car and for some reason the keys would not go into the ignition and uh, eventually she discovered why. Uh, she found her way to her car, which was a couple rows over, and uh, she loaded her groceries, got in her car, drove to the police station, and reported to the policeman what she had done. And the policeman was laughing. He said, well, look down there at the other end of the, uh, the office. There were four young men who were filing charges against a, uh, an elderly woman 
described as five, less than five feet tall, glasses, curly white hair, carrying a large handgun <laughs> and uh, trying to hijack their car. Anyway, it's important that you know where you are. It's very important you know what time it is and where you're at. Some of you may be like me. If you are dreaming, if you're in deep sleep, uh, sometimes my dreams are so vivid that when I open my eyes, I'm not really sure where I'm at because my brain's still telling me I'm back in my dream. And, and it might be dark and I don't know exactly where I am or what time it is and uh, not even sure uh, where I'm at at all. And Paul, in this text, he uses two different words to describe time. And the first word is kairos. It's, it, it, it's not like a point in time. It's not like a second hand on a clock or that you look at the clock and say, that's the exact time. This word is describing a season. And what he says here, he says, you need to know the season that you're in. You need to know, you know, when we, when we speak of a season, it's an extended period of time. So when we think of like the harvest season, uh, some of you are, have already planted your gardens and you'll be harvesting uh, probably through the last part of the summer and fruit comes on in, the, in September usually and, and grains and wild game in October and, and then we celebrate all that in November. So it's an extended period from summer all the way through the month of October usually in this part of the world. And so he's describing something like that. He says, he says you need to know the season that you're in. And the point here is simply this. We are in a season that we might labor for the Lord. You need to know that. You need to come awake to that. God needs to stir within you, open your eyes, that you would not be groggy to this, but you would know the season where you are. Theologians call this particular day, the season in which we live, the age of grace. And uh, in, in which God is, is patiently waiting for others to come to faith in him. You know, when Jesus was readying himself for uh, his disciples, actually readying them for his departure, he's, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if we're not so, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again. And that's the season that we're in. He's left, but he's coming again. And, and this season is really what you need to contemplate. If you are spiritually in tune, if your heart is in tune with the Lord, you need to understand where you are. <clears throat> this was puzzling to the disciples, and before he ascended, they asked him, now, is this the time when you are going to establish your kingdom? And, and uh, this is what Jesus said. It's not for you to know these times or these seasons. The Father has fixed by his own authority these seasons. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. <clears throat> And so he says, this season, this season is a time for you to be busy in testifying about me with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that you would be my witnesses. Now Paul says, know what time it is. Know this season. This is a time for us. You know, this uh, coronavirus did not surprise the Lord at all. We may be entering a day in uh, which... We will have a new freedom to travel and, and speak with others and, and to mingle with others. Uh, perhaps that day is coming soon. But the question is, will we, will, are we going to be ready for such opportunities? During this time of, of quietness and introspection and social distancing, has the Lord been calling you to a spiritual awakening? It might be that, that He's preparing you and preparing the church that your heart would be in such in tune with His that you'd be ready to launch into ministry in a new way, with a new vigor. <clears throat> According to the dictionary, sleep is a state of inactivity with lots of... I'm sorry... Let me start over. It's a state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to the events taking place around you. And so this passage is really causing me to ask this question. 
whether I and whether the church will continue in a state of sleep or will we hear the voice of God? Do we really understand the season in which we exist? Some of us may need to be slapped awake to see the world as God sees it, to have His heartbeat for others. And God doesn't want us to just turn like a door on its hinges to hear a message like this, a challenge like this, and not really launch out. He longs for us to engage this world and to testify of His death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the second word that He uses in this text is the word aura or hour, and it can be translated uh, a moment in time, a specific time, but it really has the idea of a, of a uh, powerful, pointed time. The King, I like the way the King James translates this. It says, it is high time. This is like saying, you are past due. You are past due to wake up. You are past due to have this work done in your life. And uh, he's getting very, very personal here in, in verse 11. It's like he's getting right into our business and he's saying something like, you've been a Christian for how long? Don't you think it's time for you to wake up? Don't you think it's time for you to to start hearing the voice of God and his call upon your life? It's time for you to get out of bed. Stop playing games. Get serious about your walk with God. Come awake to God. thinking about this verse, I was reminded of Isaiah. And there was a time, a day in his life when it was a dark day. It was the, the year in which King Uzziah had died. It was a discouraging, dark days for the people of God. And yet it was during that time that suddenly the light came on for Isaiah. And he saw the Lord. And he saw him in his brilliant glory, his holiness. And immediately Isaiah was convicted of his sin and he confessed his sin. He said, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And it was when he confessed his sin that God touched him and cleansed him, purified his life, forgave him of his sin. And this was a spiritual awakening for Isaiah in a way that uh, he had never experienced before. Isaiah says, It was then I heard the voice of the Lord, and the voice said, Who am I going to send? And Isaiah immediately said, I'm right here, God, send me. His heart was ready to go. There was an awakening that took place in his life. And that is what Paul is describing here in the book of Romans. To these believers in Rome, he's saying, you know, it's time for you to wake up, get with it. He says, you need to understand the time in which you live. This is very, very crucial. God has appointed you for this particular day, for this moment, this season, that you might reach your generation with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is what I mean by a spiritual awakening God admonishes us to get with it and to realize where we are, that we're in this season of grace and it's the season of harvest. Jesus said this to his disciples. These crowds were coming to him and they were burdened with with all kinds of cares and worries and physical problems and spiritual problems and he was ministering to them and and he said, open your eyes. I wonder if we could say his disciples were asleep because they didn't really see the people as Jesus saw them. Jesus said, said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. These fields are white. They're ready for harvest. You know why there aren't more workers in the fields? I think a lot of them are sleeping. Open your eyes. You're right in the middle of a harvest field. You know, third admonition here is realize what's coming. 
Salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Paul says salvation is closer to us than ever, and, and some of you might be reading this and are looking at this and saying, hold on, preacher, I thought salvation was a done deal. When you believe, you're saved. It's done. When a person comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is secure. Now, why is Paul saying that salvation is still yet future for these Romans who had, had already come to faith in Jesus Christ? <clears throat> well, that is true. When you believe at that moment, you have salvation. It's a done deal. And Jesus said it this way in John chapter 5. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. This is, this is past tense. You have been. You are secure. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, for by grace we have been saved through faith. It's a done deal when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are secure. You are saved now, tomorrow, and forever when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus the Bible also speaks of a present tense of salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.18 is an example of this. Paul said, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to those of us who are being saved. Now, the word saved means to be rescued. And so God not only saves us, sets us apart, and, and redeems us for all time at the moment of faith, but throughout your life, as you encounter various temptation and as, as you're growing, He is rescuing you from sin daily. He prays for us. He, he pleads our case before the Heavenly Father. And, and he, he works in us and causing us to, to grow strong that we might be rescued from the peril of sin that would do destruction in your life today. And so there's a present a aspect of salvation, but there's also a future aspect of salvation. Paul in the Romans chapter 5 said it this way, having been justified by his blood, that's past tense, salvation, we shall be saved from the wrath that's coming, yet future, there's a future sense. And that's what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 13, this future day of salvation, it's coming, the day of his wrath and then the entrance of his glorious kingdom is going to come and, and it's the next great uh, scheme of events that are going, is going to take place on earth after this day of grace, the, the Lord is going to come with his wrath and then establish his kingdom. And we will be saved on that day from all of the wrath that's going to come upon this earth. And so Paul is referring to this future tense of salvation in this passage. And, and now what does this mean for us in practical terms? You might be saying, you know, I've heard all this before. The Lord's coming. Preachers have been saying that for 2,000 years. How can we trust Paul when he told the Romans 1,940 years ago that salvation was near? In fact, when you look throughout the scriptures, you find that all of the apostles preached this message. <clears throat> Romans chapter 16, we're going to see in our study later that Paul says soon, soon Satan is going to be crushed under our feet. <clears throat> James, he said it this way, he said, uh, be patient, strengthen your hearts, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Peter said it this way, the end of all things is right here. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober, of sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. In Revelation chapter 22, the angel that uh, spoke to the Apostle John, said, these things must shortly take place. All of the events of the tribulation period, they're, they're, it's going to be a short time, and they're going to be here. And the Lord himself spoke to John uh, in that same chapter and said, I am coming quickly. Now, how can this be? We know that uh, Second Peter, he describes mockers who will mock us for believing such things. They will arrive on the scene and they will say, ask questions like, 
you know, just look at history. Everything just keeps cycling. It's going on and on like it always has. And, and the Lord's not really going to come. And this has been going on forever. And Peter says they, they forget two things. Number one, God brought judgment in the past. Uh, righteous preaching of Noah extended for 120 years and people mocked him as well. And then judgment came. And so they forget about the judgment that has once come upon the earth. And the other thing they fail to remember is this, that with the Lord a thousand years is a day, and a day is like a thousand years. You see, God sees these events outside of time. He sees them side by side, and He says, right now we are in the age of grace. We are right here. This is where we're at. And the next thing, it's, it's the next thing that's coming soon is the, the wrath of God in my kingdom. It's going to come. And once these things kick into place, we're going to see the, the uh, seals and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. They are going to boom, boom, boom. They're going to rapidly accelerate through time. And it will be just a short time and then his kingdom. It's going to be like laps at a NASCAR race. Thing, things are going to accelerate. And one thing that I've noticed these last couple of months, how quickly, Everything is upside down. And the Lord says, He's coming quickly. What's next? It's right around the corner. The next, the next season is going to be His judgment and His kingdom coming. And once they can get, that judgment kicks into gear, it's going to be rapid. It's near. It's the next thing. So this nearness is from God's perspective, but I also think there is a personal human side to this. Salvation is nearer to us than when I first believed. I, I, I first believed 54 years ago. Now, for some of you, that seems must sound like a, an eternity. But it has gone by incredibly fast. When I examine my life, I, I really don't have much time left. And, and here's the practical application. Do I want to spend the rest of my days sleeping? I need to realize what's coming. <clears throat> Notice verse 12. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. He's describing this kingdom of darkness in which we have to put up with right now. Uh, we are in this world, but we are not a part of this world. And the dawn is just beginning to break. It's right on the horizon. The coming of the Lord is, is, is right around the corner. And this is a description of the kingdom of God right before us. It's lighting up the eastern sky right now. And for those of you that are my age or older, you know, if at best you lived into your 90s or if you miraculously lived to 100 years of age, James said, our lives are just like a vapor. They're very short. It's, it's right around the corner. We're going to be into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Some of you may still be thinking, I like my life the way it is. Um, living for myself. Why shouldn't I just keep on sleeping? You need to understand that the kingdom is a day of great reward for those who've stayed awake. Jesus, Jesus gave explicit instructions about his coming kingdom. He said uh, on the Mount of Olives, he gathered his followers and he said, uh, you know, no one knows the day of my return. The angels don't know it. Nobody knows. No man on earth knows when I'm coming back. And he compared it to a homeowner going on a trip. He said, it's like a man going away and he leaves his house and he leaves his servants in charge and he gives them each different tasks. He says, okay, here's what I want you to do and here's what I want you to do and this is your job and, and these are your assignments. And he tells the one at the door, he says, now keep watch while I'm gone. Do what I've asked you to do. Whenever I read this text, I'm reminded of an experience that I had as a a young man, I was only about 14 years of age, and my parents were going to leave for a, an extended weekend, and 
they, they told my uh, brother uh, that he would be in charge and gave us different chores and to take care of the place, obviously, and be responsible. Well, my d- brother decided it would be a good time to throw up a, a wild party. And he invited all of his friends, and uh, it was the sort of thing, as I look back, I just kind of sat back, uh, I was kind of amazed at what was taking place, and it was like every parent's nightmare. My brother thought he was in the clear. Friday night, the party took place. My parents weren't due back until Monday, so we'd have plenty of time to clean up. And Saturday morning early, we heard a knock on the door. Woke us up. There was no way my brother could clean up all the debris from the party the night before. And so he he went over and he just barely cracked the door open. And... uh, My great aunt and uncle, who had never visited us before, they had decided they would come out for a visit. They didn't know my parents were away, and they wanted to see where we lived and and visit with us for a while. And there was no way my brother was going to open up the door and let them in. It was the most awkward thing for me to stand there and watch as he tried to get them to just leave. Um, And they couldn't understand why he wouldn't let them in the house, obviously, and there's something about that experience that reminds me of what it's going to be like for some Christians. When the Lord comes back, it's going to be a day of great embarrassment. Now, you might not be living a life of debauchery. You might just be living life for yourself. Totally unconscious to God's voice and His call upon your life. You are certainly not fulfilling the tasks which He has given you. Now Jesus, He told His disciples, He said this is the application in His illustration in Mark chapter 13. If the Master comes suddenly, do not, do not let Him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, be awake, be alert. What he's saying to us is that we need to be faithful, we need to wake up, we need to hear his voice, we need to walk in obedience to him. To be living in such a way that is insensitive to the will of the Lord when he comes back will be the height of embarrassment, much more so than my brother ever experienced. John the Apostle, he he said it this way in his epistle. He said, little children, abide in him. Stay close to him. Enjoy fellowship with him. Hear his voice. Be sensitive to his leading in your life. So that when he appears, you'll have confidence. You'll be able to open the door wide. Say, Lord, here I am. And you won't shrink away from him in shame. Paul knew that there would be a special reward for him because he stayed awake. He remained acutely aware of God's call upon his life. I love what he said. When he came to the end of his life, this is how he described what he was anticipating. He said, uh, in the future, I know this. There's a prize awaiting me, a special reward. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord is going to give to me on that day, and it's not going to be just for me, but it's going to be given to all of those who were faithfully waiting, anxiously longing for His return. They were wide awake. They were looking for Him. And some of you may one day be reminded of this message and these admonitions with great regret because that day might be a day of humiliation. It would be much greater than what that man experienced when everyone saw him sleeping during the Super Bowl. And the truth is that much of the church today, I'm afraid, it's like they've taken those little signs at the, the motels and hotels, do not disturb, and they've hung them on the door, and they just go back to sleep. 
My prayer is that uh, if you hear a message like this, you will not go away unchanged. You won't remain the same. You will humble yourself before God like Isaiah. You'll say, God, here I am, send me. I am ready. When you open the door, I'm going to go. I'm not going to hold back. I want to be empowered by your spirit that I might be a faithful witness for you. Father, I pray for your children that have heard these words today, that you would call us out of spiritual slumber, that you would uh, awaken us to your voice and your call in our lives. Lord, make us very sensitive. If there's a young man on a bus, if there's some neighbor, if there's someone that needs to see the Lord Jesus Christ and hear the truth concerning him, that we would be faithful witnesses in our own Jerusalem, in our Judeas, in Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, Lord, that you would raise up your church. That we would not be uh, bashful, but that we would be bold in, in following you. And Father, I pray for any right now that may have heard these words, that uh, they think of the judgment to come and they know that they're not ready, they know that they have not even heard your voice in the past, but maybe today they've heard your voice calling them. And they know that uh, they need to enter into the family of God to escape the wrath to come. And I pray, Lord, that right now they might pray a prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. I put my trust in Jesus for my salvation and in him alone. And I pray that right now you would rescue me from my sins, that you would give me new life. Help me to live for you the rest of my days. I pray in Christ's name, amen. So now if you prayed a prayer like that, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd like to send materials to help you in your Christian growth. And you can contact us at melrosecommunitychurch.org uh, or you could call the church office here at 541-672-4522 and uh, we'll be in contact with you and, and encourage you and help you with uh, materials in your, in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.